Production of this program is made possible by a grant from the John Templeton Foundation and is a co-production of The Ohio State University, COSI, and WOSU Public Media. I have come to Columbus and to COSI because I've been interested in the intersection of science and religion, I think, for a long time. I was looking at a newspaper clipping just the other day. It was just a short Q&A that I saw with a man who won the Nobel Prize for chemistry five years ago. Peter uh, Agre is a scientist from Minnesota, and he got the Nobel for work that could lead, it is thought, to treatment for terrible tropical diseases like malaria. In the Q&A, Dr. Agre said that he is confirmed in the Evangelical Lutheran Church. He said his scientific interests were originally directed toward the diseases of poor countries because of all the Lutheran medical missionaries from Minnesota that he knew growing up. Missionaries would go off to places like Cameroon. Now, the reason Dr. Agre's little Q&A resonated with me personally that I want to share with you is that I myself have spent a decent amount of time growing up in Africa, actually with Lutheran missionaries. In high school, my dad is a college professor. Uh, by the way, his master's is um, from Ohio State. He, he called me today to remind me to tell, to tell you all. Uh, my dad, the college professor, got the chance to teach in, of all places, it sounds so random, but Madagascar. And I spent part of my high school attending a high school in Madagascar among the lemurs, and even more weirdly, among Lutheran missionaries from Minnesota who ran the school. <laughs> and I was confirmed Lutheran that year. The missionaries are very good at what they do. <laughs> and when I returned from Africa to my home state of Maine, still in high school, I was accepted into an internship at a famous genetics laboratory that we have up there. It's called the Jackson Lab. It's where a lot of the genetically standardized mice that scientists use uh, are grown, actually. And I did some research, doing my best to master the scientific method with mixed results, I must say, at age 17. My little research paper had a fancy title that I could recite for you, but uh, it didn't amount to much in the way of advancing the world's scientific understanding. It did, however, advance my own scientific understanding. I went into that lab with real lab technicians from 8 a.m. till 4 p.m. every day for an entire summer, studying lymph cells in the immune system. Now, it turns out, Peter Agre, in his big Nobel Prize for Chemistry way, had a similar experience to me in my little high school lab way. Neither of us, neither of us, has come to see a conflict between matters of faith and science. Agre, in the article I noticed, cites President John F. Kennedy on the question of his beliefs, quoting JFK, With a good conscience, our only sure reward, with history, the final judge of our deeds, let us go forth to lead the land we love, asking his blessing, his capitalized, and his help, but knowing that here on earth God's work must truly be our own. I will moderate the discussion here among our eminent panelists. I make no claim to be an expert on science or evolution or how faith fits into public policy, but something about which I do have a fair amount of experience is civil discussion. The grand American experiment only works if you and I and all of us can find ways to patiently and in an open-minded way listen to each other, learn from each other, and find a way for people who come from different backgrounds, different disciplines, different faiths to interact in a mutually supportive way. Every week I go on TV, maybe some of you have seen, and I often sit on a couch or in a studio or around a kitchen table with someone, and often it may be someone who holds a view with which I personally disagree. Deep inside, I don't agree. I know there's a tradition, particularly on cable television now, of shouting down people with whom one disagrees. It's like the British imperialists, while traveling to the colonies, figuring everyone speaks English if you speak it loudly enough. That's the cable TV way. You know, I've got to tell you, and I think we all know this here, right, that we cannot run a country an inclusive democracy if we're constantly declaring rhetorical or ideological war on people with whom we disagree. But you should know that I am not a person who believes that scientists have all the answers. 
couple years ago, I went back to that genetics lab to give a speech, it turned out, and I got to meet with some of the folks there. And I met with a scientist who has been instrumental in identifying the gene for aging in the mouse, the gene that makes a mouse old, presumably. You know, imagine the implications. If science better understands or harnesses the aging process someday in humans, it would, I think, change the world as we know it. It would stand health insurance and life insurance on their heads. Social Security, retirement, are young people willing to get taxed to pay for a much older population? I mean, think of the questions. So what did this wonderful, eminent scientist have to say about those implications? In essence, he looked at me and he said, not my problem. My job is to work on this in the lab. It's someone else's problem to work out the economics, the politics, the ethics of this, is what he said to me. And I found that personally a disappointing approach. He may not be representative of all scientists, and I think we're going to learn from our panel that he's not. Science, though, may not have an answer for everything, and that's among the many reasons we very much value all the non-scientists here, those of you who've taken time out of your busy schedules to brave the chill autumn air and to spend some time with us this evening for this interactive session. One last word from William Penn, the proprietor at once upon a time of the state to your east. William Penn, a champion, right, of democracy and certainly religious freedom. He once wrote, I know no religion that destroys courtesy, civility, and kindness. I'm now going to introduce our panel. In turn, they will have their presentations, and then we'll get down to the good old questions. First of all, it's alphabetical order. Carol Anelli has been at the forefront of efforts to peacefully and inclusively resolve perceived conflict between science and evolution, particularly in public schools. Dr. Anelli does research on teaching methods and approaches to teaching while continuing to publish on the history of entomology and evolutionary thought. She has a BA in biology from Southern Connecticut State, a master's and PhD in entomology from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and is currently an associate professor of insect physiology at Washington State. Carol Anelli, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, In the next few moments, I'd like to do three things. First, I'd like to tell you something about my personal history. Second, I want to give you the briefest possible overview of the history of scientific thought. And lastly, I'd like to tell you why I believe it is critical that the general public, and especially our students, have a solid understanding of evolution, what it is and what it is not. First, I am a second-generation Italian-American. All of my grandparents emigrated from Italy to this country at the turn of the 20th century. Knowing this, if you know anything about demographics, you'll not be surprised to learn that I was raised Catholic. I graduated from Catholic school. My family is deeply religious, and I have great respect for the religious beliefs of others. I'm also an educator with an abiding interest in the history of science, which brings me to my second point. Historians trace the origins of scientific thought to the ancient Greeks. These great thinkers, such as Aristotle and Hippocrates, observed the world around them and tried to provide rational, naturalistic explanations to account for what they saw. This was a far cry from the civilizations that predated the Greeks, for example, the Babylonians of Mesopotamia, who invoked supernatural explanations for natural phenomena. To them, destructive floods and beneficial rains were the work of Adad the storm god, who hurled thunderbolts. Greek naturalistic thought flourished for centuries in the Western world until about 200 AD. At that point, scientific thought pretty much ground to a halt for about a thousand years, as science became governed by ecclesiastical doctrine. This system of thought lacked the possibilities of free inquiry, which are vital to scientific discovery. With the Renaissance of the 1500s, a great revival of science got underway. This is when people like Copernicus and Galileo began questioning the Ptolemaic view, which held that the sun revolves around the earth. 
This view had been considered dogma, and contravening it was tantamount to heresy, for which one could be burned at the stake. Also, during the Renaissance, Vesalius and Harvey were making major advances in human anatomy and physiology. Their findings were challenging some of Galen's writings, which had been recorded 700 years earlier and which also had been considered dogma. What might we learn from this glimpse of the history of science? To me, the most compelling take-home lesson is that science advances only when great and curious minds are allowed to pursue it. This brings me to my third point. Why should the general public, and especially our young people, have a solid understanding of evolutionary theory? The short answer is because evolution is the unifying theory of all biological disciplines, and evolutionary principles are routinely applied to the problems that we see in agriculture, health, and human and veterinary diseases. Think better wheat and white rice varieties. Think design of flu vaccines and drugs to combat HIV AIDS. Think finding a cure for Alzheimer's. Every day, researchers exploit the genetic makeup we share with other organisms, such as bacteria, fruit flies, and mice, to understand how genes function and how cancer might be cured. Studies with so-called lower organisms provide valuable insights into human biology because all organisms share a common ancestry. This is the powerful idea that Darwin articulated, powerful because of its tremendous wide-ranging utility and applicability. Who but our most able-minded young people should be at the forefront of scientific research? And how can we ensure that we get there? Well, we should see to it that the federal funding agencies charged with doing such research, and the big ones are NIH, NSF, and the USDA for the biological sciences, continue to be supported through our tax dollars. But unless our students are properly educated, and I mean all of our students, they will come to view tax dollars for basic research on bacteria and fruit flies which is grounded in evolutionary principles, as frivolous rather than crucial. Today's students can and should become tomorrow's scientifically informed members of society, active in their communities, serving on public school boards of education, and performing cutting-edge scientific research. They are the leaders and caretakers of tomorrow. As the wealthiest, most powerful nation on the planet, I believe we owe this to our children and our children's children. Thank you. <laughs> Moving on to Connie Burtka is with the program on science, ethics, and religion of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, stemming from her long interest in the relationships between religion and science and their influence on the public's understanding of science. She was that program's director for five years. For about eight years prior, Dr. Burtka was a senior research associate at the geophysical lab at the Carnegie Institution in Washington. She got her Ph.D. in geology from Arizona State and has a master's of theological studies, a degree, from Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington. Dr. Burtka recently went back to that seminary to teach a course on contemporary issues in science and religion. Connie Burtka. Thank you. And... Yeah, let, let me clarify that um, although I'm very supportive of the program, I am turning my attention full-time to my, my work at Wesley, so I'm no longer uh, at AAAS but cheering on the sidelines. Um, I, I think it's very important that fruitful conversations, like the one I hope we have this evening, begin with definitions. So, and this is very true for a conversation about faith and evolution. This conversation is going to be informed, whether we recognize it or not, by our definitions of religion and science. And as a result of these definitions, what we end up thinking the proper relationship between the two things should be. So let's start with science. What is science? The scientific community, and by that I mean the practitioners of science, 
We'll answer that science is about using natural processes to explain the natural world, and that as an exercise, it's characterized by the continual testing of these explanations. Ultimately, no scientific theory is safe from revision. It will be revised or abandoned if facts continually arise which are inconsistent with the theory. What's religion? Now, whereas the practitioners of science can come to an agreement on a definition for science, it's widely recognized that religious pluralism complicates the possibility of offering a single working definition for religion. And I'll leave it to the sociologists of religion to argue about whether or not a single definition is possible. And I think focus my attention on the religion in the U.S. that by the sheer numbers we're most likely to be in conversation with, and that's Christianity. Now, even that limitation doesn't provide me with a definitive definition, for Christians hold a range of specific beliefs. But it does provide me with a framework for identifying the resources that Christianity can call upon to define itself, that is, its way of knowing. And those resources are scripture, tradition, experience, and reason. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I need to digress here for a moment. Know that I have a Master's of Theological Studies from a Christian seminary, and actually I was raised in the Roman Catholic tradition. I'm currently a member of a Unitarian Universalist congregation, which is a very liberal offshoot of Christianity, that while purposely avoiding creeds, places a very high value on religion especially religion as community, seeking the truth in love. And while many Unitarian Universalists may shy away from the word theist to describe their personal beliefs, I don't, and I prefer to continue my own journey within the realm of theism, and particularly, I'm very open to what I can continue to learn from Christianity. All right, back to the definitions. What happens if we're not attentive to definitions for science and religion? Well, one possibility is we come to the conclusion that these two, definition, these two disciplines are invariably in conflict. And I believe this is the mistake that both scientific materialists and biblical literalists make. The scientific materialists assume that scientific, the scientific way of knowing is the only way of knowing. And then they go on to extrapolate scientific findings beyond the natural world to philosophical claims in general. Biblical literalists also extrapolate their primary way of knowing, a literal interpretation of the Bible, to specific claims about nature and hold that these are superior to any scientific understanding of nature. Well, there is an easy way out of this dilemma, and I suspect you recognize it. It's a contrast way of relating science and religion. Now, the contrast approach places the emphasis on the different domains that science and religion occupy. Science is restricted to the natural world and limited to how questions. Religion to the supernatural and limited to why. As so defined, they have very little to do with one another and conflict is ruled out. This approach has been very fruitful in protecting the integrity of the science classroom because it clearly defines what is appropriate to teach there. When it comes to court cases and anti-evolution legislation, the contrast approach has gone a long way to ensure that the integrity of the science classroom is upheld. Yet the anti-evolution legislation keeps coming. And I suggest that this is indicative of the deeper issues that we can't address if all we can use is a contrast model. The problem for me isn't the attempt to describe the differences between science and religion. We need to understand those boundaries. And I, too, want people to understand that they do not have to choose between belief in God or accepting what science is learning about the world. But are science and religion totally different domains? Is what I learn about the world through science irrelevant for my understanding of what the world means? I suggest that the contrast model comes at a cost for both science and religion, but that it's religion and particularly the scholarly exploration and clarification of faith referred to as theology that stands to lose the most. If the natural world is God's world, 
how can theology ignore it? For example, scholars in the science and religion field, working from within a Christian tradition, will emphasize that embracing evolution from within the context of the Christian tradition can open that tradition to a deeper recognition and consideration of God's relation to and imminence in nature, as well as God's continuing creation. This isn't to suggest that challenging questions about divine action and theodicy won't be encountered. They will. But dodging these questions by assuming that science is irrelevant to theology can be a failure on our part to participate in a conversation about ongoing revelation, a conversation that a creator God may be inviting us to be engaged with. Now, the theology and science playing field, in my opinion, is not equal. I'd argue that scientists can and do practice scientific research with little regard to theology, and that despite this, science and technology does and will continue to advance. That's not to claim, however, that science isn't paying a price as well. Despite the fact that the courts have mandated that only science be taught in the science classroom, are we confident that students in this country are learning about evolution there? And further, that they accept its validity outside the classroom. Does science stand to lose if people accept that it is irrelevant to religion, the domain of meaning? Now, searching for a way out of this irrelevancy can begin with a reconsideration of our definitions of science and religion. Philosophers of science will point out that science is not the strictly objective practice that scientists often claim it is, Without losing sight of the fact that the science is heavily weighed towards empirical testing, we also need to recognize that it is a human community that undertakes this task, and therefore historical and cultural factors will play a role. In other words, not only reason, but also tradition and experience are part of the scientific enterprise. Likewise, in a religious way of knowing, scripture, tradition, and experience don't operate independent of reason. So the goal here isn't to disregard the very real differences between a religious and scientific way of knowing, but to recognize that there's room for conversation. Now, a large challenge to that conversation is that, in general, the professional practitioners of neither science nor religion are adequately prepared to converse. Most scientists in training will not be encouraged to learn about the history and philosophy of science, let alone pursue even a minimal understanding of theological scholarship. And most ministers in training will leave seminary without ever being challenged to move beyond a contrast approach, or worse, to assume that it's acceptable to discount what we have learned about nature through science. The good news is that work has been and is being accomplished in the area of conversation between science and religion, but I'm afraid it will never extend beyond the interests of scholars out to congregations at large unless seminary faculty and leaders are proactively working to make this dialogue part of the seminary experience. Now, for their part, scientists can choose to either ignore or proactively encourage this effort. Either way, they can continue to do science. However, if congregations are left to fend for themselves when it comes to understanding God's relation to the natural world that science is discovering, then I think it's unlikely that concerns over the teaching of evolution will ever be settled and the integrity of the science classroom will continue to be threatened. Scientists can continue to do science, but it may not be a meaningful exercise to anyone but themselves. Thanks. Tanya Burka. Joan Roughgarden is an evolutionary ecologist at Stanford whose work on evolutionary adaptations to changing environments in community ecology has been at the forefront of the field for over 30 years. Dr. Ruffgarden is author of a number of important books, including Evolution's Rainbow, Diversity, Gender, and Sexuality in Nature and People. That book proposes that Darwin got it wrong and is hopelessly outdated on a very key issue, sexual selection. The book offers an alternative theory, social selection, in which gender roles and sexuality are adaptations within, here's the key word, social infrastructure used to produce offspring. In another book, especially relevant for our discussion this evening, is called Evolution and Christian Faith. Dr. Ruffgarden looks at ways of bridging the chasm that we're here to talk about this evening. 
And there's another book, I guess, set for the new year called The Genial Gene, Deconstructing Darwinian Selfishness. Dr. Roughgarden. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you all for coming, first of all. This is, I think, a huge audience and uh, testimony to uh, a spectacular interest that this subject seems to continue to enjoy. Um, and I guess I should say first uh, that um, my, to indicate where I'm coming from, uh, my parents were missionaries. I grew up in Indonesia and the Philippines. My father wasn't a minister. He was an engineer, and he was working for the Episcopal Church, building churches and hospitals, and, uh, and then later for the United Nations. So I've uh, been raised uh, in this tradition and uh, continue in it today. And therefore, like many of you, perhaps it just seemed almost incomprehensible that there would even be a conflict between science and religion because uh, it's, there certainly wasn't one during the period that uh, I grew up in, in my, my religious tradition. So I thought what I would do today or this evening is to mention a couple or three specific things and, and not speak generally. And uh, the first is um, how uh, evolution is presented, uh, how we teach it. And in the book that you mentioned, Evolution and Christian Faith, uh, I pointed out that the Bible already contains a lot of the major elements of what we call evolutionary theory today. And as a result, one doesn't have to teach about evolution in terms that seem very techy and uh, frozen and rigid. And I called attention to two passages in particular, one in uh, Genesis about uh, Jacob, the farmer. And uh, it's a very, it's a lovely uh, tale. And uh, Jacob had, a, in paraphrasing, uh, of an altercation or a long-standing dispute with his master, uh, Laban, and they struck a deal, if you will. Now, uh, in this, Jacob was a man of God, and uh, uh, Laban uh, is the uh, villain. And they struck a deal whereby uh, Jacob could keep the livestock that were uh, speckled, and uh, uh, and the, the other livestock would revert to the ownership of Laban, and that's how they would settle their uh, dispute. But then uh, God uh, uh, caused the speckled livestock to, be, to breed more vigorously, and uh, uses the phrase, jumped on or leapt upon, the ram leapt upon the ewe, and uh, you get the idea. And uh, <laughs> so... Uh, the upshot of this is after a few generations of breeding, the, the livestock became speckled and therefore uh, uh, was uh, uh, owned by Jacob. And in this way, God's hand directed the course of evolution of the livestock. And throughout the Bible, you'll see a lot of reference to uh, uh, breeding and uh, uh, the, the activity of farmers. And this is exact, this is natural selection, the hand of uh, nature, if you will, uh, guiding the uh, uh, evolution of, of a stock. And Darwin's accomplishment, of course, was simply to carry and apply these metaphors to nature. So the word natural selection, as you know, is a take off on the word artificial selection, which is just plant and animal breeding by a, by a farmer. The idea is that that process goes on in nature all by itself without a farmer's intervention. And similarly, there's another passage in the Bible uh, that pertains to uh, randomness and the concept of randomness, which is relevant to the biological idea of a random mutation because evolution isn't random. It's just the mutation process, the genetic mutation process that's random. And, uh, and in this story in the New Testament, uh, a, uh, a farmer is going along and has seeds, mustard seeds, in his cart. And the seeds fall out of the cart, and some land on stony soil, and some land on so-so uh, soil, and some land on really great soil. And the ones that land on really great soil then expand and grow and bear fruit. And uh, Jesus talks about his own teaching with that metaphor and talks about his 
teaching the whole multitude uh, and, and that his ideas land on ears of those who can hear as well as on the ears of those who don't hear. But of those who can hear, then they go forth and prosper uh, with that knowledge. And the same thing is true of, uh, of the mustard seed, which lands on uh, fertile soil. And I've used the metaphor, I've called a, a genetic mutation a mustard seed of DNA, which is thrown at random into different bodies throughout the population. And then when it lands in a body that it does well in, that body produces fruit. And, and in that way, uh, evolution uh, comes to uh, predominate uh, from the descendants of that individual. So all of these ideas are actually present in the Bible if you bother to read it. And as Connie was saying, scientists though will, won't go into, won't read the Bible. And conversely, um, uh, people who think of uh, evolution as the enemy, as the enemy text, are not about to go through it to see uh, possible connections with the Bible. So even at this most elemental level, uh, there need not be a conflict between uh, evolution in particular and, and uh, the Bible. Now, another issue I wanted to mention is the ambiguity of the word intelligent design. If you speak to people, uh, who are people of faith and ask them, do you uh, agree with intelligent design? Do, it becomes clear that uh, there's a widespread misconception about intelligent design. Most people of faith who do think they uh, adhere to it, it intelligent design refer to the general idea that God set the whole universe in, in motion and that the universe that unfolds before us is the unfolding of a grand design from God taken as, as intelligent. And, um, but that's not the intelligent design position that uh, has emerged from the, and, and the intelligent design literature associated with the Discovery Institute, uh, which is a conservative uh, think tank in Seattle. And there, the picture of intelligent design is f focused specifically on structures like the eye and the ear and the little tail in the back of a bacterium called the flagellum. And according to those folks, those particular structures are supposed to be too complicated to, be, uh, cr um, uh, to evolve from, from natural selection, from the, from the usual evolutionary process. And so they see a big problem there. But um, I've termed that the god of plugins. You imagine that there's a lineage, and, uh, and I've caricatured it as saying, well, there are a bunch of bacteria walking around, and they're blind, and they're stuck in the mud, and then, you know, then uh, the creator, the intelligent designer, plugs in a, a, a flagellum, and all of a sudden, the descendants thereafter have a flagellum. And this is preposterous. And, um, and I think makes a mockery of the notion of intelligent design conceived of as uh, the whole of nature unfolding according to God's plan. So I, I do wish to caution people to be very careful if they think that there's something to the intelligent design position because what it actually is is a fairly trivial and, and obviously incorrect uh, claim. And finally, I'd like to remark that uh, the study of evolution, the science of evolution, is not a set piece. It's not done. And I definitely agree to the idea that we should teach the controversy. But the controversy should be real controversy, not made up controversy, like this business of uh, the intelligent design uh, folks from Seattle. Uh, the real controversy, the aspects of evolution where I think there's pretty heated debate at the moment, concern uh, the way in which uh, the the exterior characteristics of, the anim of a plant or animal called its phenotype, the way in which that comes out of the genes within the organism. And so according to the biological jargon on this is you go from the, gene the genes or the genotype to the phenotype, which is the exterior characteristics and behavior. And just how you go from genes to phenotype is really hard to figure out. And, um, and it's quite, there are a lot of, disputes as to just how that's being done. And how it's being done matters to how you try to figure out how fast evolution can take place. Because if you get your picture of how genes e eventually materialize in the ex 
nocturnal appearance of animals. If you get that, that wrong, you're going to uh, misestimate how fast evolution can go and uh, how responsive it is. And there's a lot of argument about this. And then another area which I'm personally involved with involves the critique of Darwin's account of uh, the relationship between the sexes, between male and female. And, uh, and in particular, the most biologists at the moment think that there is a state of conflict, universal conflict, between male and female that uh, traces to the very origin of, evolutionary origin of male and female. And I've disputed that, and my laboratory has published uh, counter articles on this. Um, and of course, there could be conflict, and undoubtedly is now and then. I think we've all seen that. But <laughs> the question is whether it is universal and primitive, and uh, there from the beginning of time. And um, so that's a, a very heated area at the moment. And um, so there is a lot of controversy to teach about evolution. But, uh, and I hope maybe that we can teach the, controver the real controversies and, and get everyone more in engaged in uh, the, um, you know, the give and take of science rather than just see science as being a, a little act that's being played out by uh, remote actors. So that, that's, um, that's my comments. Thank oh, you. To start, start thinking about who's going to come up to the mic to ask the first question. I just I have a quick, but I think significant, definitional question to start. You all, scientists, don't say the fact of evolution. You say the theory of evolution. And you know, when I'm talking theory with my pals around the in the bar around a beer, theory means kind of something that just you know you got a hunch. Does that suggest that evolution is some kind of informed hunch, the fact that we call it a theory? Who wants to start? Carol? Um, sure. Uh, well, this is certainly the cause. You've hit on something, David. This is a cause of a lot of um, miscommunication and misinterpretation, um, probably because scientists don't communicate really well. I don't know if you've noticed that. Um, <laughs> we're not always very good at that. So to a scientist, a theory is a very big thing. It's not the hunch that I have when winter comes and I'm in a 20-year-old car, which I am, that my car won't start. I have a theory my car won't start because of any number of things that can go wrong with it because it's 20 years old. Um, for us, a theory is a very special term that means uh, an explanation of a body of knowledge that has withstood a lot of experimental work. Uh, there are many lines of evidence that support it. And so it's really a grand synthesis of knowledge that has withstood the test of time by a lot of people doing a lot of different kinds of work. It's been corroborated by a lot of people, as we say. So if I do an experiment and 20 years later someone comes along and does a similar experiment, they should get the same or similar results. So there's, there's a great deal of work that goes into um, that kind of research before it gets to be called a theory. And there are theories you are familiar with. The theory of gravitation is one. So we, we recognize in that, and I'm, I'm not a physicist, but I know that everything isn't known about the theory of gravitation. But I also know, as a scientist, that it has withstood a lot of tests and that it's a grand synthesis of ideas um, that goes back hundreds of years and has still been supported. So theory is a very big term for us, and we don't use it lightly. And I'll let others give a, their explanation of it. Yeah, I, that, that is really a, a major problem, so much so that I've sometimes sat in conversations where scientists are suggesting, in, in terms of thinking about public engagement, maybe we just need to stop using that word. <laughs> because no matter how many times we explain it, the, the colloquial sense of it is going to rule. Um, the banana of evolution? <laughs> uh, evolution is a fact, is a, is a favorite catchphrase, rather than talking about the evolution, the theory of evolution. However, I, I think if you, if you went that route, you lose something, too, that, that is a, 
that helps you understand how science works in that you, you're never done. You're continually allowed to keep testing this theory and seeing how new observations stand up against it. Um, and I think that's what, what Joan is suggesting. We're, we, you know, just because we overwhelmingly accept the theory of evolution doesn't mean we're not still learning things about evolution. And so I think if we, if we gave away the, the term theory and quit using it in reference to, to evolution, we'd also be giving away that idea that we're continuing to learn. And um, I can add to this by saying that I, I find it helpful to, to draw a strong distinction, a strong fact theory distinction. And uh, the facts of evolution, as I see it, are uh, twofold. First, that all of life is united through membership in a common family tree so that uh, you are related to starfish and to worms. I am also related to starfish and to worms, and I am related to you. And, um, and if you hug a redwood tree, you're hugging a distant relative, you know. And, uh, and since the time of Darwin, this has become really clearly established as a fact, particularly through DNA technology, in which you can basically do the kind of pedigree analysis that you do use to find deadbeat dads with, well, you use that same technology to find out who's related to whom, and so now a very nice family tree of all the living, of all of life is uh, being worked out. That's a fact. And then another fact is that biological species change through time, unlike physical species such as oxygen and water and so forth. Water never changes. I mean, it's, it's a static and eternal, but a species changes. Now, the theory is the explanation of the facts. And so the theory of evolution could also be a true theory. It could be a true explanation. And this is where, uh, as um, Carol was saying, we could uh, show the, uh, you know, th that species do change through natural selection and so forth. But I think if you separate fact, you know, the empirical facts that from, from the explanation of those facts, you get a clarity between what is a fact and what is a theory. And, um, and I agree that, and it's the theory part of it that keeps changing, not the stuff that's already known to be a true explanation or a true story, but there are parts which are still somewhat conjectural, and they're, uh, they're downstream from the parts that are, uh, have really been nailed. All right, I'm going to ask one more question. Yeah. When I'm, they're done it answering my next question, there should be a nice, warm human being at that microphone ready to state their name and ask a nice question. Um, I was here in Ohio not long ago talking to a pastor here in Ohio, and he brought me upstairs at his uh, school and showed me this glorious fish tank full of tropical fish, symphony of, of color and, 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 and motion, and he says says to me, looking at this fish tank, you look at that and tell me there is not a God. When you look at a fish tank like this, Joan, do yeah. you see a God? The work of a God? Um, well, a, uh, when I snorkel on a coral reef, I might. Uh, uh, Maybe I the just, tank. just the, the tank is really a an attempt to capture nature, which I kind of uh, uh, rebel against a little bit. Um, the, <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, you know, I don't wear my religion on my sleeve so that I don't go out and, and whenever I see a beautiful day, say, oh my gosh, this is God at work, you know. But sometimes I thank God that I'm there to see the beautiful day and to see the flowers and the fish. Um, and, uh, but I, I don't, my view of how to, of, of God is very similar to Connie's and, and her faith tradition is one in which God is experienced through community. And I, I don't feel that God is reached by deduction. And I think that for example, in debates with atheists, the framing of the debate is often put as though one should argue an atheist into 
uh, becoming a person of faith. And I don't actually know of anyone, maybe there is someone, but I don't know of anyone who's a person of faith who got there by concluding there had to be a God on the basis of some evidence. It's sort of the other way around, that you are a person of faith experientially, and then, uh, then, then you're positioned, in a sense, to enjoy the whole of nature and to appreciate the whole of nature in a new light. Connie, what, what would you have said to the pastor looking at the tropical fish tank? Um, well, I have to be honest. I love to fish, so I might be thinking about if I could use any of them for bait to catch That's bigger right. fish. They were very beautiful fish. <laughs> the big fish I would catch would be beautiful, too, but the... the I think that's a fine example. I, I'd have to look at it and say, I totally agree. Look at this incredible system that, that God created for diversity to rule. Look, evolution is, is God's creativity in action in my book. And so when I look at those fish and I see their diversity, I have to marvel at the way God chose to do it. So in one sense, I wouldn't have a, a, a disagreement in the big picture with, God, with, with the pastor. And I think you, you made an excellent point. If you think about intelligent design from a macroscopic view, for, for a religious person um, accepting that the world is God's creation, then it's, it's difficult for a religious person to say, well, I don't believe in an intelligent designer. But that's a very different use of the word than, than trying to look at specific instances of design. So if the pastor wanted to point to a specific fish and say, well, certainly that one couldn't have, <laughs> we couldn't have got that one through evolution, then I would have to, to disagree. Tell us your name, sir. And your, your uh, Steve uh, Bornstein. Uh, t- two of my uh, favorite quotations from Albert Einstein, uh, the first one is, uh, dogma is the enemy of truth. And the other one is, everything should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. Uh, I'm kind of very concerned about our country in that we, the United States appears to have uh, a very large number of people that insist on uh, literal interpretations of, of Scripture, uh, etc., compared to the rest of the world. Uh, do you have any explanation for that or... Do you have a cure for it? <laughs> By the way, what are the statistics of uh, num- uh, percentage of the population that believes the Earth, for instance, is less than 6,000 years old? We know that, right? That's like 42%. 42%. In the U.S. What do you think about that idea? That uh, What is the way forward in the, in the view of Mr. Bornstein to get to a place where... Um, People are embracing the scientific approach. Well, my feeling is actually that that the people you're referring to are being somewhat misrepresented right here. If, for example, I, the numbers about evolution, I don't know about the age of the Earth, but the, fr- the fraction of the population that is not convinced that evolution has taken place or that humans have evolved is on the order of 60 or 70 percent, and that is not that is not the number the fraction of the population that are that are literal uh, th- that believe in the literal interpretation of the bible so i think that those who would ascribe to a literal inter- literal interpretation of the bible is on the order of 10% or or even less maybe even 2% it depends and uh and so what we're dealing with is a very widespread skepticism uh which is which by people who are scientists uh is being attributed to fundamentalists when it really isn't a problem of the fundamentalists. It's a problem of the, the poor job of education, I think, that an explanation that we're doing of science. And, uh, and I think that you know, all of us are somewhat have to be, consider ourselves culpable in this because it's been on our watch that uh, the... Um, a skepticism of science has become so widespread. And we can analyze why that's happened. Part of it has to do with how effectively we teach science. Also, some of it has to do with the increasing perception of scientists as a uh, pressure group or as a, uh, 
as a, uh, as a constituency with an axe to grind. And, and so there's been, therefore, the loss of the sense of scientists as impartial. And uh, uh, often, quite explicitly, with scientists advocating that other scientists take policy positions. And, uh, and then, of course, I think there's been a slow erosion of scientific authority from the continual culture wars within academia and in the uh, denial of the possibility of objective or scientific truth in the academy from humanists especially. And, and po people who are trained in political science, for example, you can talk to undergraduates in political science and they will generally be skeptical of evolution and skeptical of science, and skeptical even of the possibility of scientific truth. And so we're not talking about fundamentalists. We're talking about a much more uh, interesting problem. Carol? Um, well, I guess the, I, I certainly agree with, as far as what I understand when I look at the numbers, the, the, it's a very small percent of the population that has this biblical literalist view um, where the earth is taken to be some 6,000 or 10,000 years old. Um, it's really a, quite a minority. I think that, I think that um, it's true, Joan, Joan has hit the nail on the head, that it, this has occurred um, on our watch. Um, that is that scientists don't explain things very well to the public and we maybe don't do such a great job in the classroom. Um, so I think we are culpable, culpable to that degree. The other thing I think that's been shown is that while it is a small minority, they're a very vocal minority. And so it tends to sound like um, a bigger problem maybe than it is because they are given a lot of voice and they're well organized. And it's something that I think is incumbent upon us as scientists to make sure that we try to speak to the public and hence us being here tonight. Let me clarify a statistic. Um, the 42 percent is the number of people in America who believe that um, life has existed in its present form since the beginning of time. That's, right. that's, the, not, that's necessarily, the yeah. right. not necessarily, yeah. Not necessarily 6,000 years, years, but yeah. life. And, and that, that number, you'll, you'll find that represented across the board in terms of, you, you'll find people with that persuasion in evangelical groups, in uh, Catholic groups, in, in Protestant groups, so there, there's people who hold that belief across the board, which is, I think, your point about the yeah. skepticism goes further than biblical literalism, and we tend to think, oh, if we could, you know, if we could just get past the biblical literalism, the issue would go away, and, and I think the numbers show that that's not going to be the case. It's not just about biblical literalism. Um, where I think I differ a little bit is that it happened on our watch. Well, I think historically, especially in this country, because um, to say it happened on our watch is in some way to, I guess, to say then that the Europeans or, or places around the world who don't have the same issue with evolution that we do in this country, are they doing something better in terms of scientific literacy, and I think there's data that, that shows you have to decide how you're gonna define scientific literacy, but once you do that, there's no data that suggests they're doing a better job than science educators in this country. So I do think it's inescapable that in the US, this issue is, is related to our religious history, and um, our, our religious history and our education history. In other words, that education is controlled locally and not nationally, and that, and that we value uh, religious freedom and religious choices. And, and both of those things feed in, I believe, into why in this country evolution has a harder time getting accepted than in, in other countries. In some ways, I think science has sort of been under attack in the public sphere. I'm, I'm even going to... David, I'm even going to mention that you. I think you you kind of pulled out a, a straw man in your in your opening, which like science doesn't know everything. Well, no scientist is going to tell you they know everything. They're working on it. Kind of, you're making a point of what ways are there of knowing? Are there good ways or of knowing? But I think the I think a discussion is better is like what are the good ways of knowing? You actually channeled exactly my point about scientists knowing everything or not knowing everything because of these other ways of knowing. Now, who wants to start? I bet Connie has something to say about that, because I've seen some pie charts about um, many different ways of knowing. And Go ahead. The, 
I, I don't think I use the word good ways of knowing. And if I did, I would have to, to preface it with, first of all, what it, what is the, the, what's the context for the knowing I'm trying to do? So in other words, if I'm doing science, then I'm going to be weighted on the scientific way of knowing. But I also think to do good science, I, I still need to recognize that I'm a human doing science. And so therefore, I'm... There, there's also a tradition within the scientific community and, and my own experiences that are going to play a role in how I do my science. But by and large, the science I do is going to be weighted on what science is, natural explanations to explore the natural world. So in terms of a good way of knowing, if I'm doing science, that's the way I know. Now. At the same time, I recognize I'm not going to know a whole lot about all there is out there if I limit my way of knowing to, to only what I can learn from science. So my experiences in community and religious communities and, and communities that came before mine, so in, in that regard I'm thinking about the, the Christian tradition and what I read about uh, Christian struggles, trying to understand what it means to be a Christian and how they live in the world through the biblical literature, that becomes part of my way of knowing as well. So um, I think they're all good, but you need to pay careful attention to where you're applying which area of knowing. Production of this program is made possible by a grant from the John Templeton Foundation and is a co-production of The Ohio State University, COSI, and WOSU Public Media.